we're going to discuss the concept of SQL injections. Uh, SQL injections are a very common type of vulnerability that exists inside of web servers and web applications. The idea is that if you have a SQL server that is typically queried, when the user queries that, if they have control over the input, they may be able to inject malicious code into that input in order to essentially be able to execute arbitrary SQL commands against your database. So to start off with, I have this login page that's vulnerable, but I want to give you a bit of an intuition behind the back end. So we have this local host uh, PHP MyAdmin setup. And inside of here, we have a users table. Inside of this user table, we have the usernames of each user as well as the passwords of each user. And again, typically when we store passwords, we would store passwords in a hashed format. However, in this case, I put them into plain text for the most part so that you can easily see what's going on and not have to sort of like work your way around like the hashing algorithms and that sort of thing. So very simply, when we query this database, if we want to check if a user exists, what we can do is we can do something like um, select username from users where username equals test five, password equals one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, when we query this, we're going to get back the username if the user exists. Um, if it doesn't exist, we'll get back nothing. So that's a very simple example of how we could query this database to determine if a username and password matches something inside of the database. Now, inside of our PHP code for this login page, we do essentially that. So let me go ahead and show you. So inside of here, we have a PHP and HTML sort of setup. When we post the uh, HTML form, it comes into our PHP code. Our PHP code gets the username and password inputted from the user. It concatenates them into that query that I was showing you before, and then it queries against the database. It then checks how many rows were returned, and if the number of rows is greater than or equal to one, it means that it matched at least one user, so it sends you to the welcome.php page. Otherwise, it will tell you that your login was invalid. So if we were going to test this, we can input something like, um, so test five, one, two, three, four, five, six. That would be a valid log, and it takes us to the welcome.php page. If I enter something that's invalid, you'll see it says your login or password was invalid. So that's the general sort of flow structure of this login page. The problem with SQL injections comes from this concatenation here. When we concatenate the user input into the query itself, essentially what happens here is when we execute the code, it's going to see the user input as code rather than seeing it as input. So it's going to be relatively impossible for the SQL server to distinguish between the two. So it'll execute whatever's inputted as code. So to give you an example, when we come through here, if we were to input a password that had a double quote in it, so for instance, if our password was something like uh, this, you'll see it ends up interpreting that as code and gives me a syntax error. What I can do is I can input something like this, or one equals one, and then maybe a comment at the end. What this essentially does is it closes this off and it makes it where username equals test five and password equals blank or one equals one. And then we comment out the rest to get rid of the syntax errors. One equals one is always going to be true. So since that is the case, when we execute this query, it returns back the whole table. So this is sort of the idea of what SQL injection is doing. We're essentially um, inputting in something that could be interpreted as code. And that code is going to allow us to either like return the whole table or potentially do other things. Um, it really depends on sort of the application. For login pages, typically we want to make it return a valid input, so um, an actual valid login or something like that. Now, one thing you might note here is that we return the whole table. Uh, when we do this query here, we check if it's greater than or equal to one on the count. You may be asking yourself, well, what if we set it as equal to one? And that's a valid question, right? If we set it as equal to one, it seems like an okay defense for this. However, we can also inject limit one at the end, which will limit the outputs to just give us one result back. So it's not necessarily a good solution to just say, well, what if we just uh, you know, limit the, uh, the input to one instead? We can easily write code to do that. So to show you this in action, if I type in like test, for instance, test five, we'll do the same user. As I said before, I want to input a single quote and then or one equals one and then a hashtag. So recall essentially what we're doing is we're closing this off to make it or password is blank. And then we're saying or one equals one. And then we're putting that hashtag and we'll forget about this limit portion here. Just keep it simple. We put in the hashtag, which comments up that last single quote that's left, which will make it so that the syntax is now valid. 
And now when we submit this, you'll see it authenticates us. So as you can see from this, I gave a totally invalid password. However, I still got access to the login page. So this is an authentication error. It allows us to authenticate to our web page without actually having valid credentials, which is a huge problem. Now, it's not the only place where this shows up, of course, and it's not always just explicit user input that allows for SQL injection. User input is just one of the attack vectors, but there's a lot of other places where it could potentially happen. And I'll talk about a few of those now. One other common place where, uh, where SQL injection can happen is when we take server variables from the user. One good example of this is sometimes when a user visits your site, you can find their IP address using PHP. There's a possibility that the user could alter pieces of information that um, they're representing themselves as. I don't think IP address is one that you can really alter, but if you can look at things like uh, host name or that sort of idea, uh, the referrer, that sort of thing, if you put that sort of data into a database, for instance, you may accept it regardless of the format and concatenate it on. If the attacker is able to alter where they're coming from, for instance, like the referrer is a pretty good example, um, if they're able to alter the referrer to put in a malicious payload like this, they could potentially expose data from your database or cause it to do something bad, like um, insert a user, for instance, or drop tables, um, depending on the permission set of the querying agent, right? So this would be an example of another way that you could attack um, a server using that. Another common one is cookies. Um, when you authenticate with a web page, you're typically given back a cookie, or if they're trying to track data from you, they'll give you a cookie. There's a lot of different instances where you get a cookie. That stores a lot of different information inside of it. It's also controlled by the user. So the user could do things like modifying that cookie to be able to change the data of it. And again, they can change the data to something malicious like these SQL injection commands and manage to leak the database completely, right? So that's another example of an instance where we can do that. Um, the final one that I'll talk about is ones that essentially happen on second order is what it's referred to as second order SQL injection. And these are instances where suppose I put my username as something that's invalid, like this um, SQL syntax. It might not inject immediately, but maybe that username gets used somewhere else. And that place where it gets used is vulnerable to SQL injection from the programmers like trusting their own data over the data provided from the user. So you have to be very careful about how we accept data from users. If anything is under the control of user, things like file names, cookies, server variables, anything like that, we need to sanitize that data to make sure that the person isn't able to put malicious data inside of it. Any instance where you can put in malicious data is gonna be an instance where you can have a SQL injection occurring. Now, to discuss a little bit about the types of attacks, we've discussed one type of attack here, which is this or one equals one. It's typically referred to as a tautology. A tautology is a statement that always evaluates to true. These are really good for leaking data from databases that we shouldn't be able to see or forcing authentication and that sort of deal. There's one other type that's relatively common, which is referred to as a piggybacking query. With a piggyback query, what we do is we actually utilize unions. So as an example here, when we set password equal to blank, we can also come over here and union it. So we could say union and then union another table. The only condition being that the number of fields has to match. So if you have something that returns back data from a database, for instance, and has three fields that it returns back, what you could do is you can union a different table. So for instance, um, in MySQL, there are a whole bunch of uh, tables that store information like the tables that exist inside of a database, that sort of idea. So we can query that table with a union and be able to return that information. And then once we have that information, we can find more valuable tables like login tables, and then we can leak those types of tables as well. So this is known as piggybacking. Um, you'll see this fairly often in a lot of different applications. One that is sort of like near and dear to me is content providers through Android. Um, if you're not familiar with Android, um, essentially applications can export things called content providers. And what these are is they're special types of listeners that essentially allow people to query data from your application and it returns the data back to them. In these sort of situations, the user is able to control the projection, which is the fields that are inserted in, as well as the where clause. So they can do piggybacking queries fairly easily. And essentially what happens is you can piggyback on um, a union of like, sorry, all of the tables in the SQL database and it will return it back to you because it doesn't really control what data is returned back. 
And that's one way that we can leak data through, say, content providers, for instance. And there are ways to protect yourself against those, of course, and we'll discuss some mitigation strategies that are relatively generic to any language. Um, I'll show you examples of them. But um, that's just one example that I've typically seen that is typically not thought about because a lot of the times people don't understand um, exactly what users are able to do when they query your databases. Um, in these cases, we always want to make sure that we sanitize user data. We always trust to set the user data as malicious. We don't trust user data. We always assume it's malicious and sanitize it properly, right? So let's discuss a bit about mitigations of these types of attacks. From now, you understand how an attacker can pull this off. So um, we'll discuss a few common mitigations and discuss sort of the pros and cons. One of the ones that I see very commonly is doing uh, my SQL I escape character. So you'll see here in the PHP code, I've added these uh, MySQL I escape character or escape strings. What these do is they escape SQL code. Um, so if you put in like single quotes or that sort of things, it adds in escape characters that they aren't interpreted as code, but rather as um, text. These are really great for situations where you have um, fields that require single quotes in order to close them. However, I wanna to demonstrate to you that this is not always a good solution. What I've got here is I've got an alternative version of our login form where we have the username and then we have the pin as a password. Think of this like a bank pin. Um, you know, if your bank is, accepts like a numeric input for the bank pin, um, then you could have potentially a situation where you have um, an input for the password that doesn't have quotes in it, right? So you'll see here, if I go ahead and do like some SQL code, if I were to say where uh, pin equals one, two, three, four, You'll see when we execute this, we get back the pin that's equal to one, two, three, four. We don't have to put the single quotes around it. It's not required to do that. Um, so since this is the case, there's nothing that really can get escaped from this. So for me to demonstrate this, let's go ahead and go to this, um, go to this other page here. So we'll say login, um, what did I call it here? Login escape. And we're going to give this a try. So again, if we do something like test one, two, three, four, that's a valid input. It lets us through to the welcome page. Now, if I do something like um, or one equals one, you see how I put in like the closing quote there. This won't authenticate properly. Um, you can ignore this error. That's just from me not properly sanitizing to make sure that the query is actually successful before I try to extract data from it. And a properly designed web application, you wouldn't have that error. But you can see next to that, the login is set as invalid, which is what we want to happen. However, I want you to realize if we don't put in the single quotes, we still get a valid SQL injection. We can say equals uh, one or one equals one, right? This input has no SQL characters in it. There's no special characters inside of this. It's literally just text. However, it's also a valid SQL injection. As you can see here, it authenticates us to the welcome.php page. So this is a word of warning. If the last thing in your where statement is numeric, and it has no quotations associated with it, someone will be able to exploit it even if you escape the SQL characters. So really keep this in mind. A lot of people use that as a generic solution that always works. It does not always work. There are situations where that does not work, so you need to be aware of them and work with better types of mitigations. And the better types of mitigations are what are known as prepared statements. With prepared statements, what we do is we set up a statement to prepare a SQL query. When we prepare the SQL query, we put in question marks for the username and password. So we put question marks for the inputs, and then we bind the parameters to those inputs. So we say there's going to be two strings. Here's the first string. Here's the second. What happens is when we go to query the database, it's going to take this username and it's going to place it in turn of this question mark. It's going to take this password. It's going to place it in turn of this question mark. And it's basically just going to replace the question marks with actual parameters. Why this works is because when we do a prepared statement with binded parameters, it ensures that it treats the inputs as inputs. It does not treat them as code. That's the key point here. We don't treat the inputs given from the user as code. So we're able to sanitize it using this, um, this type of uh, prepared statement. This is the correct way to protect yourself from SQL injections. There's nothing wrong with also using like escape characters with prepared statements, but you should always use prepared statements um, if you're working with SQL queries. Just in general, anytime you're working with a SQL query, I would use a prepared statement. There's no reason to be concatenating user inputs to SQL queries, so don't ever do it. Just use prepared statements and you'll be totally fine.
especially if you're getting data from the database, if you're getting data from anywhere, really just use these statements because um, you never know where an attacker might be able to get data into your database. They might be able to exploit it pretty badly with these sort of vulnerabilities. So this would be the main mitigation that we would want to work with. And in essentially every single um, different programming language, there's, there's a different way to prepare statements through the, um, through the SQL uh, libraries and such. So you just need to determine which one works for you. This is the PHP version. There's also another one in PHP called PDO. So um, there's, there's really not much difference between PDO and using MySQLi. Um, again, it's really just up to preference of which one you like to use. When I was discussing the idea of content providers, there's one final thing that I want to discuss with this, and it's instances where you might be able to get input into the fields of the select statement. This is, again, not a particularly uncommon situation to happen. It happens with uh, content providers I know quite frequently. I don't know about other types of SQL queries. Um, there could be instances where you could like select what kind of fields you want to put into a report, and that gets put into the select statement, right? What I want you to be aware of is, so if we say like username, for instance, um, the user can put in whatever fields they want. What they can do is they could do something like this. If they put in fields, they can say select is already there. And then the fields could be something like, um, they could select uh, username, password from users, right? Users is a different table. And then what they do is they just put a comment at the end of it. And what this does is it essentially creates a new select statement. So this is something you also have to be careful of. If you allow input into the fields, like in content providers in Android, um, you need to be aware that people can insert in any sort of SQL queries in there. They can put comments at the end of it and they'll end up getting a perfectly valid SQL statement and manage to do an injection. The way that you get around this sort of thing is you check the user input to determine if the column that they are trying to access is actually a column inside of the database. If it's not a column in the database, we don't execute. We just say, hey, that column doesn't exist. If it is a column in the database that we do execute and everyone is happy. So that's the main way to prevent against this. So all of this should give you a really good intuition behind um, how SQL injections work. Generally, where they're typically located, what kind of uh, attacks are typically common with them, and how to mitigate the attacks. So um, it's a good idea to go through your applications, make sure you're using the proper prepared statements, and try some of these exploits to see if they break your application. And if they do, make sure to patch up those problems because SQL injections are quite bad vulnerabilities. So um, this should help you out with getting that secured in any sort of web application that you have. We're going to take a look at the idea of command injections, which is essentially a way of being able to inject um, code into a web application. And it's relatively similar to other types of injection type vulnerabilities, things like SQL injections and that sort of thing. The general idea of it is the same, that we're going to input something that gets interpreted as code, or in this case, as a command, and then it will execute against the server. And the idea is that by doing this, we're able to execute any system command against the server with the same privileges of the, um, the user that runs the web application, which means that we can either expose information about the server or potentially upload things to the server or get re um, reverse shells. And typically reverse shell would be the, the goal of doing an attack like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the basics of how this sort of attack works and give you a general idea of what exactly you're able to do with it. So just for a little bit of context, I have this, um, this Linux virtual machine that's running, and this is what I'm using as my server. So when I log on to this, um, essentially I've got like this index.php file. Uh, it's a rather simple file. Uh, let's go ahead and cat it. Essentially, what it does is when we get a post request, it takes in the um, the IP that's provided, and then it's going to go ahead and it's going to execute the shell command to ping the IP that's provided twice, and then it will echo out the output from that. So the idea is if we can insert something into this ping command to get it to execute along with the ping, so to do the ping and then sort of do something else, that would be the way that we would be able to get a command injection to actually happen. So to understand exactly what's going to happen, you should understand a little bit about how um, Linux handles commands, right? So when we run the ping command, so if I do like ping hyphen C to of my, my local IP, for instance, um, 
hyphen C is count, so it'll say that it'll ping the IP twice. So you see it pings twice, and then it gives you sort of like a summary of the actual ping itself. Using a lot of different methods, we can actually concatenate commands together so that they run like two at a time. So one of those in Linux is a semicolon. A semicolon essentially tells it, okay, there's the first command, and then here's a second command. And we could do something like cat um, etc slash password is a typical one that you would do. What this will do is it will expose the content of the, of the password file, which contains all the users that are on the system. So you see when this happens, it will do the ping and then it does the second command afterwards, which would be exposing the contents of that password file. So this is one way that we are able to concatenate commands together. And there's a few different ways that we can do this. Um, and they're all just different characters that separate. So um, another one that we have is these two ampersands and it gives you a similar sort of output. Uh, it's equivalent of doing essentially an and. So with the first one, we were saying like uh, run the first command and then run the second command. This one we're saying run the first command and also run the second command. So this will allow us to concatenate the commands together as well. This one is particularly helpful if they happen to, um, you know, censor the semicolon parameter. Um, for instance, like if you enter in an IP, it's typically like a numeric value with periods only. So um, if you were to try to protect from this, you could do a regular expression to take in only digits that have like periods or that sort of thing. Um, and in some cases, you might be able to, um, to sort of sneak some other characters in um, using like the ampersands or some of the other characters that we'll go over here. Uh, so understanding different types of uh, ways to concatenate commands together is beneficial to be able to attack different systems. So those ampersands is a very common one. Um, the single pipe is one that's very common as well. With this one, this, this is the pipe command. So what it does is it takes the input from one command and uses it for the next command that follows. So it takes the result of the ping and uses that as the input for cat. Cat doesn't take any sort of input, so that just outputs everything to the screen. And then the final one is or, which is two pipes. This one is a little bit more tricky. You'll see if I do it normally, it just pings the server and it doesn't execute our second command. The reason that this happens is because the or command will only execute the second command if the first command fails. So if we put in like a letter, for instance, the first command fails, so the second command executes. So those are the four common types of uh, ways of concatenating commands together. So when you're taking a look at the input from the server, we essentially, we have control over the IP address and we can write in a command that will have an IP address that's valid. And then we can write in one of those special characters and then the next command that we want to execute. So for instance, I could do that same sort of idea and then we could do cat um, etc password. So you can see here that we essentially give it that same input. We give it the IP and then a semicolon and then we give it the next command. When we execute this, you'll see it does the result of the ping and then it also cats the password file. So you can see that this allows us to expose the data. And just to show to you that all of them will work in this case, um, we can do, for instance, the two ampersands. Um, so that will work, for instance. Um, and we could do it with all of them, right? So we can do it with the pipes, we can do it with the with the or command. So all of those will work for this sort of instance. Um, so you can see that each of these commands will allow a command, ex a, a command execution to be completed. Now, as I was saying before, we want to know those different types of characters that work because they may be trying to filter specific ones out. In reality, if you're running a system command from a web application, it's actually very hard to actually adequately filter out all of the different types of injections that can happen. So typically, like the guidance on this is to try not to use system commands whenever possible. Um, if a server has a system command like this, like this sort of like ping feature, for instance, it tends to be relatively easy to be able to find something that will allow us to, to execute an arbitrary command. And again, just by trying those different types of um, parameters is how you're gonna be able to find those pieces of information. Now, there are a few other things to keep in mind here. If the server is running on Windows, you have to slightly modify the payload a bit. So for instance, if you're on a Windows computer, and you're using your command line, you see ls doesn't work, right? But dir does, for instance. So there's a different set of commands for Windows versus um, Linux. So you have to be sort of sort of aware of that. 
as well with Windows, some of the different commands won't work. So I don't think the semicolon one works, but typically like the two ampersands together is a really good one because it works on both systems. So uh, that's another thing to just sort of keep in mind with that, that um, if you're working with a Windows server, you have to use slightly different commands. And the slightly different command is gonna be using the, um, the ampersands. And then like, um, I'm not sure about actually counting files. Um, there are other commands, of course, that you can try, like things like dir, for instance, will expose the directory if it works. Um, as long as you get one of these to work, then you can just sort of like look up whatever command you want afterwards, right? So um, a lot of the times people will be like, you know, how, how can I get a reverse shell out of something like this? And the answer is you really just have to like run like a shell command or something like that. Or you can utilize this to expose the like hashed passwords and then do like an offline password attack to be able to brute force the passwords. Um, but yeah, for instance, like if you're able to get things like shell or something like that, or you could potentially like install malware through it to give you that reverse shell. Um, so the, the ability to do that is relatively endless, right? You could, you could do really whatever you want out of this. Um, as long as you have access to the command injection, you can literally inject any sort of command in. So this vulnerability is extremely critical. If it ever exists on a server, it's typically scored at its CVSS 10 out of 10. It's extremely critical because um, if someone is able to execute commands on your system, they can do literally anything, um, assuming that they have the proper permissions, right? But from being on the server and being able to execute commands, you can easily escalate permissions, um, either through compromising one of the files through catting like the password or shadow files, or by you know uploading a piece of malware or some payload to it. Um, if you want a little bit more detail on uploading payloads as well, um, I can give a little bit of insight on this too. The idea with this is going to be when we have um, essentially like this, this ability to um, run commands on the server, uh, one of the things that we would be able to do is create a user. For instance, we could do like user add to add a user onto the server. And what you can do is you can add a server or add a user to the server who you could then like do something like win SCP to like SSH into or to FTP into or SFTP into or whatever you really want to do. Um, in addition, you can also like enable FTP or you can enable SSH. Um, and then using that, you can essentially go onto the server and upload whatever you want onto it. And then using this command injection, you can sort of navigate to where you want to go and execute your payload from there. Um, in addition, you could also like upload like PHP files or um, you know HTML files or really anything that you really want to be able to do that. So a lot of time like website defacement can be done using this just by uploading different files or modifying different files. So the possibilities with this sort of attack are really large, right? You could do a lot of things with this, but this gives you the general idea of how to sort of prove that a command injection exists. And so the different ways that you can do that on a system that isn't doing any sort of filtering or anything like that. So using this, you should be able to, um, if you have like a, an input where you have control over a command, you should be able to try out some different inputs to determine if that system is vulnerable to this sort of attack or not. Broken authentication is the second most common type of vulnerability that's found in applications right now, um, according to the OWASP top 10 list. Uh, it's a type of vulnerability that essentially revolves around the way that we authenticate users, whether it be through username and password or different methodologies like biometrics and uh, secure tokens or that sort of idea. And it's essentially flaws in those systems that allow an attacker to be able to gain authentication without being an actual authorized user. So in this uh, video, I'll go over a few different types of broken authentication type attacks and discuss a little bit about how these sort of attacks are mitigated. So again, we, we're looking at issues that are really um, dealing with being weak or improperly implemented authentication. And authentication is really one of the key aspects of most applications, which is why it's so frequently targeted. Um, if you have weak authentication, people can gain access to your system and through access to your system, they can do a lot of worse things um, based on that. So any breaks in authentication would be considered critical issues and things that would need to be fixed really relatively quickly. So the first type of um, attack that we'll talk about is credential stuffing attacks. The idea of these types of attacks is that when there's a data breach from some website of some sort, um, that information is typically leaked somewhere online. And a lot of the time people can get access to those databases to be able to get lists of usernames and passwords, for instance. With a username and password list, someone can go to different web pages and try that same username and password against that web page to determine if the authentication works there too. 
This would be the idea of a credential stuffing attack. We have a list of usernames and passwords, uh, typically compromised credentials from breaches, and we use a bot to automate this process of attempting to log in with those credentials. This type of attack has around a 0.1% success rate, which sounds very low. However, it's very easy to automate, which means that um, it can easily be implemented, easily uh, set up to attack a system, and it will have some amount of success that will probably be able to get you at least one set of credentials, which a lot of the time is all you really need. The next type of attack is relatively similar to that, and it's related to brute forcing passwords um, and as well the general idea of weak authentication with weak passwords. Uh, brute forcing is slightly different from the idea of credential stuffing. With brute forcing, we're attempting different combinations of letters and numbers and symbols to try to guess easily guessable passwords. Um, and essentially, the idea is that we want to throw as much computation power as we can towards brute forcing these passwords to attempt to compromise the user account to gain access to the system. Now. Um, the ability to do this is actually fairly easy. If someone's using just letters and numbers, for instance, a six character password can be cracked in about three hours with like a standard laptop. So um, essentially the longer and more complex the password is, the less probability there is of being able to brute force it. However, um, in general, brute force attack tends to be a very effective attack um, if someone doesn't limit login attempts because um, odds are there's going to be at least one person on your system who is going to have a weak password if you aren't enforcing a proper password policy. And if that is the case, then they'll be able to crack it relatively easily utilizing brute force attacks. So the next thing we'll talk about is weak credential recovery. This is one that we see actually fairly frequently. Um, if a user forgets their password, they need to be able to recover it. However, the person who implements this system also needs to be able to verify who is trying to recover the password. Because if someone who isn't the right like you know person comes in and recovers the password, then um, they will be able to get access to the account without actually having to know the password. Right? They can just recover it and then change it. So there's a few different aspects to this one. Most commonly, things like recovery questions are the easiest way to uh, have a weak credential recovery type of attack. If you ask someone recovery questions, it's typically very easy to find the answers to them. Um, there have been a famous attacks that have happened um, with celebrities where people go to like interviews or Q&As and they ask their recovery questions and then they answer those questions on the web page and compromise their account through that. So um, a lot of the times this information is easily gathered through social media. Although there's a lot of information out there now. So asking recovery questions is a very bad idea for recovering passwords. Um, typically the way that we do this now now would be using um, two-factor authentication, um, an alternative email that you can email the credentials to, or like a phone number that you can verify from. So um, we use something that we know is going to be in your possession, or we hope is going to be in your possession. And speaking of two-factor authentication, missing multi-factor authentication is now becoming a big issue with um, compromising authentication. So multi-factor authentication helps add another layer of security. If you try to log in with a password, then we can ask you for some form of two-factor authentication, say like a verification code from your phone or from another email, um, maybe a fingerprint or something like that. And the idea is that it makes it much harder for an attacker to be able to authenticate as a user using um, multiple factors. So ideally, we'd be utilizing something like a phone to be able to do this because oftentimes the only person who has possession of your phone and phone number would be you. Now, there are ways to be able to attack this. Um, you may have seen recently in the news, people have been calling into customer service desks, um, pretending to be somebody and stealing their SIM card and therefore their phone number and then being able to compromise it from there. So there are weaknesses to that sort of idea. Um, in addition, sometimes people accidentally just like authenticate um, thinking that they were authenticating at the same time. You know, it, timing can play a really big role in that as well. So. There are some flaws with multi-factor authentication, but as a general sort of sweeping statement, it is typically better than just using a password. It makes brute forcing and credential stuffing much harder if you have that multi-factor authentication available. So another thing that we can talk about is things like session IDs. A session ID is typically a way of authenticating a user throughout their session with the web page. Um, if a session ID is exposed through something like the URL, for instance, like if it's written into the actual URL itself, or if it's exposed in a cookie, or it's leaked in some other way, an attacker could potentially gain access to it and be able to authenticate as the user using that exposed session ID. 
So ideally, session IDs should be properly handled um, in a way that is server side only. That way, it's very hard for an attacker to be able to gain access to session IDs or any sensitive information that can be used to verify a user's identity. So to summarize, we can talk about how we can prevent these authentication issues. Um, the main way to do this primarily is going to be to implement some form of multi-factor authentication. This will significantly help your ability to have a secure system um, and different levels of multi-factor authentication are adequate for different systems. Um, perhaps a password and a phone authentication is fine for some systems. Some systems might prefer like a biometric authentication with a password if it's more secure. So those would be really good setups to be able to help with authentication issues. Um, things like using a password policy to present weak logins, right? Someone puts in like one, two, three, four, five, six, we shouldn't be accepting that as a password. So um, this would be a good way to prevent that. Um, not shipping with default credentials is another great way. Um, if you set up, say, like some form of like uh, CMS or something like that, and it has a default like admin login, that's just like admin, admin, right? Um, that could be exploited very easily for someone to just try default credentials on a whole list of sites running that specific software. So you wanna make sure that you don't have those default credentials in your applications. Another big one is going to be to limit failed login attempts. So brute forcing relies on the fact that you are able to attempt to log in more than like five times, for instance. So if we limit invalid login attempts to five attempts um, and then lock the account, we're going to be able to prevent those brute force type of attacks. Now, this also is going to cause some issues for the user because if someone tries to brute force them, their account will be locked and then they'll have to... Um, potentially like call in to ask for the account to be unlocked or they might have to wait a certain amount of time for it to get unlocked. Um, so these sort of things are valuable, but more valuable is having a really good password policy that keeps their login secure. Um, combining the two together is great, but just keep in mind that um, limiting numbers of login attempts can be detrimental to the user as well. Uh, the final thing as well, as we discussed, is keeping session IDs on the server side. That way um, we aren't able to leak it to the client, which makes it easier for us to be able to store session IDs without worrying about people getting access to them. So this gives you a good idea of the different types of authentication issues that might exist in a system. Uh, utilizing this information, you should be able to take a look at a system and determine whether they have any sort of authentication issues and be able to suggest ways to patch those problems to ensure that your authentication is as secure as possible. I wanted to discuss a bit about the idea of um, sensitive information disclosures or in general just information disclosures and these are situations where in an application or server or some sort of you know um, thing that exists on the internet uh, we're able to disclose information from that service that tell us um, either sensitive details about a user for instance or sensitive data is about a session or sensitive data about the web application itself or give us more information that we can expand our attack surface. So this is a really big step in not only information gathering, but actually exploiting uh, systems in general. So I'm gonna show you a few different examples and I'm gonna talk about a few different examples as well to give you a bit of a feel of what exactly happens with information disclosures and why they're a bad thing. Now, there's a huge variety of different types of information disclosures. And I'll try to talk through um, a couple of examples of each of the ones that I'm most familiar with um, and that should hopefully give you a good idea of ones that are common sort of in the current environment or systems that exist. So to start off with, one of the most common types of information disclosure is error messages that are displayed to the user. In general, when we have error messages, we should try to make sure that they are error messages that are controlled by us. So the way that we do this is using try catch statements with custom messages that output information that is descriptive enough for the user to understand what happened, but not so descriptive as to reveal information to the user. To give you an example of this, I have a login page here. And when I input like a username and password, it would say your username or login is invalid. This would be a great example of a proper error message because it doesn't expose any real information. Now, if it exposed something by saying like the login doesn't exist, this would be an example of a very simple information disclosure. What that tells the attacker is it tells the attacker that the login that they're trying to attack isn't one that exists on the system. So then they can try a different login. They know it's not the password, it's just the login or username. Now, when we keep it more vague, it tells them one of the things that they entered was wrong, which means that they can't sort of understand if the user exists or not. So this is an example of something that could potentially have an information disclosure. We have to be very careful about error messages. Even further, 
If we leak an error message, for instance, this one has a SQL injection available in it. So if I put a single quote, for instance, you'll see we get this PHP warning output to the screen. When this happens, it's a problem for a lot of different reasons. First off, it exposes information about the SQL function that I'm using for the login. It exposes the location of the actual file, like the full server path. Uh, exposes a little bit of information about like um, the location of this error itself. Um, and as well, it exposes the fact that we have an error in the SQL query, which in turn tells us that a SQL injection is likely possible here. So this sort of information disclosure tells us information about the system in terms of how it's handling the SQL queries. In this instance here, it's telling us how we can attack the server in a little bit more detail, because now we know the single quote caused an error in the SQL handling, which in turn tells me that it's interpreting it as code, which in turn tells me that I can create a SQL injection type of scenario with it. So this is another good example of sort of an error message type of um, information disclosure. Now, there are other types of information disclosures that are very common. Um, one actually comes with Apache, and it's one of the uh, sort of defaults of Apache or XAMPP or those sort of server setups. What you'll notice is that if I put in something that doesn't exist, I get this typical 404 error page. Now, this looks quite innocent because it just sort of says object not found. But if you're paying attention, you'll notice that it exposes this server, the version of the server, the operating system type, um, the version of my open SSL, as well as the version of my PHP. And you may be thinking, well, that doesn't really seem like that big of a deal. However, we can easily now take this information and look up uh, CVEs for that version. And from a site like CVE details, you'll be able to see, okay, in 2019, there were all of these vulnerabilities that work for this specific version of Apache. So from here, I can just pick one that I want. So for instance, this here, I could try using to attack the system because I know the version of the system itself. So once I know the version, I can easily find attacks that could potentially work against that version number. So exposing the version number is extremely dangerous because it allows the attacker to know what they should be attacking. It tells them the version number, which is easy to sort of find these different CVEs for. So this is another example of an information disclosure. To solve this sort of problem, we can have like custom 404 error messages. Um, and you can do that through like the configuration of the Apache server itself. And that's typically the preferred way to handle that rather than using these default ones. Now, one other common one that comes up is um, access to log files or configuration files that have sensitive information. You'll actually see this a lot. Um, there's a lot of methods such as like Google dorking, for instance, where you can look up configuration files or log files. And oftentimes you can find ones that don't have the proper permissions on them that may expose a username or password or cookie or some piece of information that is important to keep um, anonymous or secure. An example that I have here is, so if I go to my localhost directory, um, I'm able to traverse my directory here and you'll see that I have this conf folder and that I created this config.txt and you can see it has all the information about my username and password and database. So these types of configuration files can exist on your system. However, they shouldn't be accessible by an outside user. Otherwise, they're able to potentially find these and be able to disclose information about the actual system itself. So we wanna make sure that any configuration files or logs are not readable by the users if they don't have to be. If they are readable by the users, they should not contain any sensitive information. This sort of information you see a lot. Um, one of the most common places where you see this is if you say run an installer for an application itself, um, Sometimes that installer will have like an install log and inside of that install log, sometimes they might be like database initialized with these parameters and they might accidentally put the password in it, for instance. And that just means if someone breaks onto the computer, they can easily find that installation log and they can get all that detail from you. So we wanna make sure that that sort of information isn't being exposed in our logs or configuration files. So then the other type of um, information disclosure that's very common and very dangerous is about like plain text transmissions and plain text storages of uh, sensitive information. So as an example with this login page, you'll notice that we don't use HTTPS for it, of course. Um, so if we use HTTPS, what happens is we create a secure socket between uh, the server and the client. So it means that all the data transmitted between them will have encryption enabled on them. Meaning that if someone sits in the middle of the two connections 
they won't see any plain text information, they'll see encrypted packets and we'll have to figure out how to decrypt those packets to get any valuable information. However, if we submit without HTTPS, which for this example we would be doing, when we send the packet from the client to the server, it would send in plain text, which means that the username and password would be exposed. In addition to this, when we send the password, in this case, I'm not sending the password with any sort of um, encryption or hashing applied to it. I would apply the hashing maybe server side. Um, and in that case, when it's transmitted, it's transmitted in plain text, which is another dangerous thing to be doing. We don't want to ever transmit our passwords in plain text if we can help it. And speaking on the half of um, hashing passwords, passwords in databases should always be hashed, specifically with a salt as well. And the reason for this is because if the database ever gets compromised, they will only have the salted hashes of the passwords rather than having the passwords themselves, which means that they have to crack the passwords. And this makes it more complicated for the attacker to actually get that information um, because they'll have to do like brute force attacks or dictionary attacks. Um, hopefully dictionary attacks wouldn't work because you would have a random salt, but um, brute force attacks essentially would potentially work if the users pick weak passwords. So with a good password policy and hashing on the password, it becomes rather hard for an attacker to be able to expose that data. Now there are things other than passwords that are important. Uh, unique identifiers like, I don't know, driver's license numbers or SIN numbers, um, bank details, that sort of information can often be compromised. So we wanna make sure that that information is sort of redacted or hidden in our database. So um, typically we'll obscure it in some sort of way or we'll hash it or do something with it in order to allow us to um, not be able to store that just in plain text. So we wanna be able to adequately protect that data as well. Now, speaking of sensitive data storage, another piece is when we have sensitive data inside of source code. Now, a lot of people think that, for instance, if you write like a job application and you compile it, we think, well, nobody's gonna be able to see the source code now because we've compiled it. There exists a lot of decompilers and reverse engineering programs that allow you to decompile code and turn it back into source code to read it. If we have passwords and usernames in plain text in that code, then somebody can just decode your um, binary just through like um, decompiling, and then they can just browse through it and search for the password. You'll actually see this very often with sort of like amateur key loggers or that sort of thing. Um, when people put up like those scam things um, for like games like, for instance, Fortnite, um, where they'll put up like a, a thing that will like generate the currency of the game and you just type in your username and password and you click OK and then it, you know, gives you free money or something like that. With those sort of programs, you can often decompile them and those people will put the email that it sends those credentials to in plain text so you can actually um, see that information. So that's something that's very common and you see it a lot, especially with people who aren't particularly skilled with programming. They often put their passwords in plain text in their source code because they think no one can get back to the source code once it's compiled, but they can. So keep that in mind. In addition, like with even with PHP files, um, when we talked about like the ghost cat vulnerability, for instance, the ghost cat vulnerability allowed you to pull pages from an Apache server that were anything, right? So you could pull the PHP code and then in turn expose like configuration data and um, potentially expose your admin passwords as well. So that's another thing that you want to look out for. Ideally, what you should be doing is having the person put in a password whenever they have to authenticate to a service or it should be stored in maybe a third party sort of way or um, using some form of encryption perhaps. Um, there's a lot of different methods that you could do. I think typically what a lot of people do is they will encrypt the password and then they'll store um, the key for that inside of the key store of the computer. And then whenever they need to access it, they use the key from the key store to decrypt the password and then use that password to authenticate to the database or whatever they're authenticating to. I think that would typically be it. Um, you also see things like API keys becoming more and more common because if those get leaked, you can just revoke the API key and it's not as big of a deal. But um, there's a lot of different alternatives next to just using a password in plain text. So you just wanna consider those as well. Now, there are a few other small ones that I'll discuss here briefly just to give you a few more ideas of um, sensitive data disclosures. Um, things like timing-based attacks are actually common. Um, Sometimes when you log in with a username and password, um, when you log in with an invalid username, it manages to check it faster than if you log in with a valid username. If you ever see something like that happening, you can actually time it and determine if a user exists based on how long it takes to authenticate. 
The reason being is because they might do like a query to begin with to check if the username exists and then check the password only if the username exists. So you skip that second step, which means that the, the process completes faster, which means that you could do timing based attacks. Another one that's become fairly relevant, especially right now, is revealing chain of command through email auto replies. So this one's a very different one from the ones that we've discussed so far. When people are out of office, they'll typically put an auto reply on their email. It'll say something like, um, I'm out of office right now. Uh, please contact this person if you need something urgently. And what that essentially exposes to the attacker is now they see that somebody is covering for you or someone is your superior. So then they can go to that person and be like, hi, I was talking with you know this person and they were gonna give me this information. I'm wondering if you can help me with that. Since the other person's out of office, the other person's covering for them, it's a bit easier potentially to get that information out of the person who's covering because they won't necessarily know that context. So you have to be very careful about the information that you're showing people. The final thing that I'll talk about here as well is the, the more classic versions of information disclosure and those are being able to get access to data that you shouldn't be able to get access to. Uh, the most classic version of this is like SQL injections. Um, if you can do a SQL injection, you can typically query other tables to get information. And when you can query other tables, you can disclose information that you shouldn't have been able to see before. So that's sort of like the classic information disclosure that allows you to um, grab information from another table. So. To sort of summarize this, when we have any sort of um, information that is being provided by our application, we need to be very careful about it. If you ever have an instance where your application could potentially error, you should make sure for one, that the default behavior is not used, that you are controlling every error message, and for two, that you're try catching every error that could potentially happen and printing a message that is not the stack trace something that is written by you that does not expose any information about the application itself. Um, same goes for things like the Apache um, 404 page, for instance, um, any of those responses, you should try to make them customized to your application so that they don't accidentally expose something that's of value. So that's something very important to note about those. Um, in general, good programming practice of um, not having SQL injections, command injections, XXE, XSS, getting rid of those vulnerabilities so that we can't disclose information, um, making sure that you aren't revealing information through email auto replies or external facing processes. And that's the general idea of sensitive information disclosures. So it's always good to be careful of the information that you're displaying to people. If ever you need to print something to the screen or show the user something, you need to make sure that you are being careful of what you display. That's essentially the, the main theme here. So uh, using these sort of uh, ideas, you'll be able to better secure your application to hide information from the users and thus prevent attackers from being able to expand their attack surface or potentially compromise your applications. In this video, we're going to take a look at XXE based vulnerabilities, which means um, XML external entities. Uh, these type of exploits are associated with being able to parse XML data in a way that allows you to leak information from the server primarily is what they do. So the way I'm going to demonstrate this is through um, Port Swigger's labs. They have a number of different labs that are available for XXE and they're very good for being able to practice the sort of foundations of these skills and to be able to sort of demonstrate all the different scenarios that you may see XXE become available in. So I'm going to approach these from the perspective of showing you how you can identify these sorts of vulnerabilities and then how you can exploit them. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we can fix them and make sure that these problems aren't present in our software. So before I start, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction towards the tools that we're going to be using for this. There's one tool primarily, which is also made by Port Swigger. Um, it's known as the Burp Suite. Uh, there's a community edition and a professional edition. I'm utilizing the community edition. Essentially, this will allow us to capture traffic between ourselves and the web page. What that allows us to do is that every time we set a request to this web page, we're able to see what data is sent between us, which will allow us to sort of manipulate the data and inject things into it, which will allow us to be able to exploit these XXE based vulnerabilities easier. So we're gonna go through a few different scenarios. The first one that we're gonna take a look at is exploiting XXE using external entities to retrieve files. The idea of this sort of problem is that um, when we use XML data, if a user is sending XML data to the server and they have full control over that XML data, what they can do is they can write in these things called external entities. And what external entities can do is they can reference files anywhere really. So they can mainly reference files that are actually on the server itself. 
And through this, they're able to get back data from the server using this XML request. So this is something that obviously we don't want to happen. And this one, we're gonna demonstrate how to get the password file um, from a Linux server, essentially. So what we'll do is go ahead and access the lab here. Uh, just to note, as we're getting on here, in order to access these labs, you will need an account. It's a free account to register, so you can go ahead and register one for that. You'll see this essentially has just like a shop and we can go into this shop and we can view details. And we go to view details, we can check the stock of items. And when we do that, it will tell us how many units are in stock in the specific store that we look at. So obviously from here, we can tell that there's some sort of query happening in the background. And from that, we know that we're basically gonna to have to pass this information from our client to the server. Anytime that we're passing information from the client to the server, there's a potential to be able to inject malicious content into the actual um, web application itself. So to be able to see this in action, we're gonna launch up Burp Suite and we're gonna do that ourselves here. So let me just go ahead and reset here. The way that this sets up, um, if you've never used Burp Suite before, I'm on Firefox in this case, it's my preferred browser. If I go into options, I can type in proxy and inside of the proxy settings here, we just have to set up a proxy configuration to the, the, the proxy that's set up on Burp Suite. So you'll be able to see that um, in general here. So you see, let's see proxy service started on 127.0.0.1 port 8080. We just put that information into here as well. And I just match it through everything and press okay. Once that's done, we'll now be able to intercept data. So um, we'll specifically go into our proxy section here and turn on the intercept. Now we'll be intercept intercepting the web traffic between us and the, and the web pages that we're accessing. So as discussed, we can come in here and we can check stock. When I click check stock, you'll see it will sort of pause. And inside of here, Burp Suite will show me the data that's being sent to the server here. So I can forward each packet and go through them one at a time and just see what kind of data is being sent through. So let's go ahead and switch it to say London and we'll say check stock. And as you can see, it shows us the general like packets that are flowing through. Now, for some reason, some of them work, some of them don't. So you sort of have to play around with it a little bit. Um, in some instances, you might get these certification um, invalid things. Um, Essentially, when you work with Burp Suite, it injects a certification between you and the server. So it will tell you that the um, certificate is invalid. You can just accept that and continue. So we'll go ahead and try this one here, for instance, and see if this one will work. So I'm going to turn the interceptor on and let's say check stock. As you can see here, you can see the general play rule that's being sent. You can see that it's sending this XML data to the server. And inside of this XML data, we have the product ID and the store ID. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to action and I'm gonna send this to the repeater. The repeater essentially allows us to modify the content of the query itself and be able to send it back to the server so that we can try different things with it. So with that being done, I'll go ahead and turn off the interception for the proxy and let's head over to the repeater. So you see, here's the general format of our XML. If we want to do an external entity attack, there's two main things that we're going to have to do here. The first is up here, we're going to have to define our external entity that we're trying to access. So we'll do this as follows. Say so doc type, I'm going to call this a foo and we'll go ahead and do this. It'll be an entity. I'm going to call the entity XXE and we're going to get a system file and that system file will be the file at the location uh, etc password. So this would be the general structure of our external entity. What we do is we essentially define that we're creating an entity and we give the entity some sort of name. And this name can be really anything that you want. I just pick XXE as this example. And we say what the entity is going to be. In this case, it's going to be a system file and that system file is going to be the file that is located at this path, the etc slash password path. Now all we have to do is just change one of these values to that external entity. And what will happen is it will attempt to access that external entity and it will return us back the results. And the results in this case are going to be the contents of the password file. So the way that we access this is we put an ampersand uh, and then we put XXE and then a semicolon. So now I can send this query and you'll see we'll get a response back here on the left-hand side. 
And as you can see, it says invalid product ID, and then it leaks all of the information that is contained inside of that password file. This is the idea of what an, exec, or an XXE exploit is gonna look like. Essentially, it's gonna to attempt to access that product ID and it's gonna be invalid. And when it sends back that invalid error, it's gonna in turn send back the contents of that external entity we attempted to access. And that would be, in this case, the contents of the etc slash password file, which as you can see is all the different users that are on the system. So you can see with this, we're able to access really any sort of file that's on the system, which is very dangerous, right? The information disclosure from this is huge. Um, if we are able to access the shadow file of a Linux system, for instance, that would give us all the hashed passwords towards which we could then do an offline password attempt attack, and then potentially be able to exploit the system and gain unauthorized access. So like I mentioned before, this is really just one way to be able to do the XXE based attacks. We'll take a look at a few others as well. So with this problem, we've now pretty much successfully solved it. So that teaches us everything about the external entities from that perspective. One additional thing we can do with XXC is we can use it to perform SSRF attacks. An SSRF attack is essentially the ability to be able to send a query from someone who isn't us. So as an example, there's a server running on here that has some metadata and there's potentially some sensitive data inside of there this IP would typically only be accessible from the server itself. So us as a client wouldn't be able to access that. However, if we use XXE, we're able to make the request look like it's coming from the server, which means that we can in turn access things that we shouldn't be able to access typically. So to show this, it's a very similar type of idea to the previous lab. Um, so we'll go ahead and access this. Um, ah, sorry, I'm gonna have to turn back on the, uh, the interceptor here. Get this going. So we'll turn this back on. Let's go ahead and access here. Ah, sorry. Okay. I think we'll just have to disable the proxy and re-enable it. Um, sometimes this will happen. I think it's because the actual session will expire. So sometimes we have to go back in and just uh, un -in or disable and re-enable the proxy. So go and do that. Let's try to access this page. Okay, great. So now we can access the lab. And then once that's done, I'll go ahead and set up our proxy again. And then we'll come back into here and turn our interceptor on. And again, we'll do something very similar to before. We're gonna go ahead and enter into the, um, into the item, right? And then once we're inside of here, again, we can check stock. So we'll go ahead and check the stock of the London store, for instance. And we'll see if this one gives us, yeah, this one gives us an XML um, structured format as well, right? So we're sending an XML request to the server. Again, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna place it inside of my repeater, and we're gonna go ahead and modify this XML, but we're gonna do it in a slightly different way compared to before. So let's just turn off the interceptor here. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use it to do an SSRF based attack. So I'm gonna, instead of accessing a system file, we're gonna access an actual URL. And the way that we do this is relatively similar. So we'll have a similar type of setup. We'll have our doc type, uh, I'll call it foo. And then we'll do our entity, uh, we'll call it xxc, we'll say system. And instead of doing a file request, we'll do a URL request here. So we'll do 162 or 169.254.169.254. .264 .164. Two five four. I believe that that's the IP, and then we just have to close off the brackets, and this would be what we're going for. Now, again, we want to put this into a piece of the actual um, XML itself, so we go XXE here. Again, remember to end it with a semicolon. Remember to start it with an ampersand. And that's the general format. Again, very similar to the previous one. However, instead of doing a file, we're doing a URL this time. And you'll see the general process and flow of this is slightly different. So now when I send my request, you'll see in the response, we get unvalid product ID latest. This tells us that the next sub URL here is latest. So what I can do is I can place this latest at the end and then query again. And when I do this, you'll see once this sends through, it says metadata now. So then the next path part is metadata. And this will just slowly expose to us the location of the secure data that we're looking for.
So again, we're just going to keep on concatenating what is given to us as the invalid product ID. And essentially all we're doing is just building up the, um, the actual um, URL based on the results of the query, right? And eventually, once we get to security credentials, um, we're going to put in admin. And what we're going to get is the actual admin credentials. So you'll see here, we get all the information for the admin. We get their um, token, we get the access key ID, the secret access key, the expiry date, um, the type of hashing algorithms that's used for this. So this gives us a ton of information. Again, this is a very devastating vulnerability to have on your system. If someone is able to exploit something like this, they're gonna be able to get your admin credentials, which is very bad, obviously. So. Again, the idea behind this is that we can make queries to web pages that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do normally. And one thing that we can do with that is we can slowly build up a URL to some sensitive data um, using the responses back from the XXE. Um, in general, the responses you're gonna get back is gonna give you information about either the page that gets visited or the URL pieces that you need to piece together to get to the page that you're looking for. Um, regardless, eventually, if you continue to query different URLs, you could potentially expose data. So this is another thing that we're able to do here. I believe this sort of thing could also be used to maybe query from the system perspective to another website to try to like authenticate against it. Um, however, I haven't really tried something like that. Uh, this is the typical use that I've seen for this type of vulnerability. So. That gives us the idea behind this lab here. What we'll take a look at next is how we can actually export this through an image file upload. This is a rather interesting one because it's not necessarily through the request, it's actually through SVG images. Now, if you don't know anything about SVG images, SVG images are essentially um, vector graphics. And inside of vector graphics, we're able to set up sort of like length and width and information about the actual vector itself. And that is in turn done using XML. So because of that, we can actually manipulate the XML in a very similar way to any other XML file that we've looked at so far. So let's go ahead and access this lab and we'll take a look at that. I'm just gonna flip over my proxy here. Uh, we'll go back into the lab. So essentially the idea here is that we have a blog and inside of this blog, we're able to go into posts and we're able to leave comments. And inside of the comments, you'll notice that there's, there's this avatar that we're allowed to put in like some sort of picture for ourselves. Now, the idea is that inside of that picture, we can upload an SVG file and that could get interpreted as XML and in turn reveal information about the server. It'll actually reveal it inside of the image itself, which is quite interesting. So I'm gonna show you what the XML looks like for this. Essentially, to understand this, you have to have a bit of an understanding about SVG files in general. So the actual XML pieces are going to work with like the XML version. It's gonna display the general information about the standard that we're utilizing. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna define our external entity like we did before. And in this case, we're, in this case, we're targeting uh, etc slash hostname. That'll be the file that we're actually targeting. And then what we do is we set up the SVG width and height. So the width and height of the image itself. And then we give it sort of like the standards that it's using for its formatting and such. And then we say that we're going to print out some font and the font is going to be size 16. Here's the X and Y coordinates of it. And the text that we're going to put into it is this external entity. So what this does in turn is it prints out the result of the external entity query to text in the image. So it'll create a very interesting sort of effect that I'll show you here. So I'm going to go ahead and type in a comment. I'll just say test, and let's go ahead and browse for a file here. Um, so I put it into here and it's test.svg. And then we can go ahead and post our comment. Uh, we have to actually put it in an email. So we'll say at a.com and let's post our comment. You'll see it will load and it will say, thank you for your comment. And then when we go back, we can head into the comments and you can see that my image there has some text inside of it. Now to get to this, we sort of had to be a little bit creative. Um, the best way that I found to do this is just through the um, through the source browser here. If I hover over it, it will show me the image. I can also navigate to that sub URL to get to the image. But as you can see, it wrote the results of the external entity query into the image itself. 
So you can see that we can be very creative with these types of attacks. We don't necessarily just have to like brute force XML data or anything like that. We can use SVGs as well. So there's a lot of creativity that you can do with these sort of XXE based attacks. Now there's one final type of attack that I want to talk about and that's X include. Now the idea behind X include is essentially that when we have XML based data, we don't necessarily control the whole XML document. We might only control a certain input of it. Um, so in those sort of instances, we have to be more creative about what we do because we can't just inject our payload anywhere. What we can do in these cases is using X include. And essentially X include is basically going to um, concatenate the XML together with other XML that we provide. And through that, we can provide a similar payload to what we did in the first two examples. And that in turn will execute and give us a result that will allow us to do an XXE based attack. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this is done. So this is a very similar type of situation to what we previously had. Uh, let me go ahead and set up our proxy here. And let's turn on our intercept. So again, we can check the stock. And what you'll see here that's um, relatively different is that when we actually check the stock, it's gonna post the product ID rather than giving us the XML for it. Uh, seems like this one doesn't seem to be working. Let's just uh, go to a different one here. Let's try this one out for size. So we'll accept the risk here. We'll just forward those through. All right, so let's check the stock here. Let's try this one out. Uh, let's forward these ones through. Oh, this one seems to be having problems. Let's try it again here. Ah, here we go. So yeah, it might take a few attempts, but eventually you'll get one that works here. This one, you can see that it posts the product ID and the store ID. So what you essentially have to do is you have to inject into the product ID or inject into the store ID. This is a very typical sort of situation. You won't usually be given the whole XML document. So um, to be able to do this, we just have to utilize um, the, X, the X include portion. So um, we'll go ahead and place this into the repeater like we did before. And let me show you how this can be done. So in params here, I can adjust the value of each parameter. So I'm gonna adjust the product ID. And what I'll do here is I'm gonna set up the following. Um, XMLNS. So this is essentially us just declaring um, the actual format of the XML document that we're going to be using. You'll notice that anything that sort of references w3.org is basically just sort of like the templated, like here's what an XML file is going to be defined as. It just sort of tells the XML parser how to parse our file. So we can have this portion. Um, we'll do backslash 2001 backslash x include. So this tells us that we're going to be using an x include. Um, and the x include that we're going to be using, xi, is going to be defined as include, um, include parse equals text, uh, href equals file, so backslash etc password. And then we'll close off the the um, the external entity. So what this does is essentially we have our our x include right, and we define the format of the x include, and then we discuss what we're actually doing with it. So we want to include a parse that's equal to text, and then we give it a reference to where the text is actually located. When we do this, we should be able to send this. And assuming I've done everything right here, we get a response back that is very similar to before, where we get the whole um, output of the shadow or the password file. So you can see how this generally works, right? The first portion here is us telling the server that we're using an include. And then after this, we put in the actual include that we have. We tell it that it's going to be text and then we give it an href for that text. And the href is an external entity, which is the, the file that we're trying to access. And when we do that, the server attempts to access that file, it returns back the text, which gives us this result here, which is very similar to before.
So this should give you a general overview of all the different types of XXE based attacks that you can do. There are more than just these four. However, um, these are the most common ones that I've typically seen throughout my experience. Um, these type of attacks are very valuable to have um, because they are quite critical if they are found. And the ability to actually fix them can be fairly straightforward. There's a lot of different ways to do it. You can whitelist the inputs that the user isn't able to input XML data into uh, post data like this, for instance. We could check the product ID to see if it has XML characters and just blow it out if it does. Um, in addition to this, typically most XML parsers that are modern will have some sort of uh, way of safely parsing data now. So you can set specific flags inside of the parsers depending on your language to be able to say, don't do this, right? To be able to stop it from actually parsing it um, incorrectly. So those are the general ways that you can sort of mitigate the risk of these XXE-based vulnerabilities. Realistically, the best thing that you can do is not allow the person to directly input X. Um, XML based data. And typically we might want to favor other types of data like uh, JSON, for instance, that don't have these types of vulnerabilities associated with them. So those are a few different factors that you can consider with these. Um, so that's the general idea of these XXE based vulnerabilities. And you should now understand how to be able to find and exploit and hopefully fix these problems if you happen to find them inside of your own applications. Broken access control is one of the um, top vulnerabilities that is discussed on the OWASP top 10. Um, I believe it's at number five out of 10. So it's a fairly common one and it sort of lives on the same sort of ground as broken authentication in the sense that we're not properly enforcing uh, controls that determine who has access to what resources on a system. So we're gonna take a look at a few different ways that this happens and then discuss some ways to mitigate these sorts of issues. So. In general, when we're bypassing access control, we're looking at modifications of things like URLs, um, HTML pages, maybe through APIs, um, application states, um, things like cookies, really anything that's in the user control, uh, they may be able to modify it and in turn utilize that to be able to bypass the actual access control of an application. Uh, in general, access control is the component that after you've logged into the system, it determines what sort of actions you should be able to take. Um, and in general, it can also determine what sort of actions a non-logged in user can take. So there's sort of two components there, either a non-authenticated user being able to do authenticated things or an authenticated user being able to do um, higher level things such as administrative actions. So one way that this can happen is through primary key manipulation. So inside of a database, you'll have a primary key which will keep track of the current record of the person who's utilizing the application. If for some reason the person has access to that private key, they might be able to change it to map to a different user which can help them circumvent access control. Um, a good example of this could be something like um, student ID, for instance. So if you're on like a student system and you have a student ID, if the user can modify that student ID for some reason, then it will change how it maps to a different user and could help them circumvent access control. Another even more common one, there are some people for some reason who may use a first name and last name as a primary key, which in general is a really bad primary key because it has duplicate values. But if you do something like that, you can actually potentially, you know, change those fields if you have power over those fields, which you usually would in an application. And that in turn could map you to different users and then help you circumvent access control. So um, things like usernames, uh, that sort of information is the type of stuff that might be able to help you circumvent these sort of pieces of information. Also in general, when you send a request for like an API or a cookie, sometimes you might have to put in a primary key like a username. If you can change that username and it doesn't verify its server side, then you might be able to get access to something you shouldn't be able to get access to. So the general process of um, getting more permissions than you normally have is known as an escalation of privilege, and that's a very typical type of vulnerability. Um, and there's a few different ways, uh, as we discussed, that this can take place. We can either um, act as a user without logging in or escalate from user to admin without authentication. Now, um, one of the things that I wanted to discuss here is the idea of um, escalation of privilege from the context of an operating system. A lot of the times if you compromise an operating system, you may compromise it as a normal user. For instance, if I have a Linux box that has a whole bunch of SSH users and they're all different users in my company, for example, if you manage to brute force one of the users because they have a really bad password, your next step would be to try to escalate permissions or escalate privileges to become an administrator. 
So if you're able to find an escalation of privilege somewhere, then you're able to escalate your permissions and become an administrative user. Um, this sort of thing happens a lot with applications. If you find an application and you're able to find an escalation of privilege through that application, say it's like a system level application, for instance, then you might be able to um, escalate yourself to an administrator without any sort of authentication. So that would be an example of escalation of privilege. And in general, things like metadata manipulation is very common. Um, if you have tokens such as JWT, which is, um, I think JSON web token is what that stands for. Um, a lot of the times people could attempt to tamper with that information. So if you're storing tokens on the user side, the idea is that you always should be verifying it on the server side. Same sort of idea with cookies or hidden fields. Anything that the user has control over should be validated server side. You should never trust it at face value. So different metadata things like uh, web tokens or cookies can often be manipulated to try to find um, an escalation of privilege. So uh, it typically involves things like changing a role to admin, for instance, or that, you know doing something like that that will allow you to impersonate an administrator without actually being an administrator. And that would be through metadata manipulation. And then one of the big ones that's coming up more and more is everybody wants an API in their application, but um, a lot of people don't really implement them properly. So missing controls on APIs tends to be a fairly common problem. Um, if you do like posts, puts, deletes, that sort of thing, um, you may be able to utilize these API calls without proper permission. So maybe typically we only want an admin to delete data, but if we don't authenticate it through the API, someone might be able to delete data without having any sort of permission. So this is a really important important one to keep in mind. If you ever have an API that has external access, different things like post and put and delete and get, for instance, should all have permissions associated with them. If they can get to data that they shouldn't be able to get to without authenticating, they shouldn't be able to run that call through the API. So we should always enforce those permissions, um, ensuring that unauthenticated users can't get access to data or modify data without permissions. So the final piece here is to just discuss like a general idea of how to prevent access control breaks. So on default, whenever you're checking for permissions, if you run into some sort of problem, you should default to denying access. So if someone tries to access something and an error occurs, for instance, you should default to just denying access immediately. So you never default to allowing the user into the system because that's how these sort of like escalations typically work. Um, we want to always log the information too. So whenever someone accesses something, we should log that information. If something looks funny with someone accessing an admin page without a username or someone accessing an admin page that isn't an admin, that can help us see that there's an access control break without actually, um, you know, having it happen, right? Well, it will happen, but we'll be able to notice it when it does happen is the idea. And then the other thing is to verify access control on the server side. We never trust user control data. We should always verify everything the user gives us on the server side in a way that they do not have control over. If someone claims to be an administrator, we should make sure that they actually are an administrator. We should not let anybody uh, be able to control that information completely. Otherwise, we're going to get into these access control breaks. So this in general gives you a few different examples of access control type vulnerabilities. It allows you to get a bit of an understanding of how these sort of things present themselves in applications. So um, if you ever run into these sort of uh, instances in your own applications, you can apply these sort of steps to fix them. Um, otherwise, this will help you sort of, you know, look for those issues to determine if they exist on your system um, to ensure that they don't happen and to ensure that they're prevented. Security misconfigurations are very common in a lot of different web applications, and they can happen whether you have an experienced team working on your application or a bunch of people who are sort of newer who are working on the application. It happens to everybody, and it becomes increasingly common as new technologies get released or new updates for the technology get released. So understanding where security misconfigurations can happen can help us locate those issues and be able to patch them when they happen or before they're discovered by anyone else. So one of the biggest things that typically happens is people will miss um, different types of security hardening. So things like this can be very simple. It can be things like compiling your application without protection, such as stack protection. Uh, stack protection can help prevent buffer overflows in applications. So when you turn off this flag, sometimes you get a more efficient program, but you'll also get something that's very um, 
more likely to be exploited with buffer overflows or those types of vulnerabilities. Um, it can also happen with improperly configured cloud permissions. Uh, a lot of the time people will set up cloud environments, but they won't tweak the permissions and settings on them. Uh, from this, a lot of things can happen. Um, I know recently there was a lot of talk about hard drive data being exposed from cloud instances where you could literally just Google search for specific words and you can expose information from hard drives that shouldn't have been accessible uh, from outside of the cloud environment. So these sorts of vulnerabilities come up fairly frequently in terms of missing those types of security hardenings. You have to have some awareness of what sort of security um, features you should be putting in place with, say, your cloud environments so you can ensure that they're properly secured when people are attempting to access them. Sort of down the same sort of uh, road as this is unnecessary features. This can include a lot of different aspects, things like ports, accounts, and software are some of the most common. So to give you a few examples, if you have an application that ships on a server, for instance, that server could have software installed on it. And the software that's installed in it should only be the things that you are using. Same sort of idea as if you have a server running a web application, that server should only have applications installed on it that are actively being used. Um, otherwise, you can have old software that will be on older versions that will just expand the attack surface for someone attempting to attack your product. Um, enabling accounts that aren't used is a fairly um, straightforward idea. If you have accounts that are on the system, they should serve some sort of purpose, whether they're user accounts or administrative accounts or things for scheduling tasks. Um, setting up accounts that aren't actually used is a big problem because they could be potentially weak points where someone could attack and then do escalation of privilege to be able to compromise the account to get administrative access. The last piece here is enabling ports that don't need to be used, and a perfect example of this is the GhostCat vulnerability. Uh, with GhostCat, the AGP port was enabled, and it was allowing people to be able to get files that they shouldn't have been able to get or do remote code execution potentially. That AGP port was something that was very rarely used by anybody who was using Tomcat. Um, for things like SAML, it was typically used, but um, there was a lot of instances where people had that AGP port enabled, but they weren't using it at all. So it just goes to show that when you default install an application, it's going to come with all everything turned on essentially, and you need to be the one to turn off the things you are using, which means that you have to have a good understanding of what your application should actually be working with and what it should actually need in order for it to be running. So by understanding what your application needs and uses, you can lower the attack surface to the point where it's only things that are being used. That means you have to keep less stuff up to date and also less things for the attacker to be able to attack. Another place where we typically have security misconfigurations is in error handling. Um, the most common is revealing stack traces to the user. If we run an exploit and we get an error, that error might expose information about what happened. And that exposure of information could tell us things about the actual um, system or service itself. Uh, it can tell us things about how the code is flowing through the application, uh, where the error actually happened, what web pages are being um, accessed. You know, It can give us a lot of information. So error handling is very important. Same sort of idea with creating error messages. If you make error messages that are too informative, you can expose too much information. Uh, the classic example is that username doesn't exist. When someone tries to log in, tells them that they um, are trying to access a user that doesn't exist, which means that they could try a different user. So they gain information from the error message, which is something we don't really want to do. We want to balance error messages displaying useful information to the user, um, as well as error messages not exposing too much information to the user that they can learn something about the applications like that functionality, right? And then default configurations, which I sort of touched on with the idea of like the Tomcat AGP port. So when you install things, uh, there'll be a default configuration. That default configuration is rarely, if ever, secure. You want to make sure that you are altering those default configurations to be as secure as possible. So changing default passwords, removing any default accounts, closing any ports that aren't using, um, stuff like that, right? So a lot of common attacks can leverage like default credentials, for instance, default configurations, just um, any sort of weakness that may exist on the system due to a default configuration uh, can commonly be attacked. So in order to mitigate security config misconfigurations, there's a few different things that we should keep in mind. The first is that we should create a repeatable process that we can do to um, 
complete our configuration on updates and upgrades. So for example, if we're going back to Ghost Cat, if I update Tomcat to the newest Apache Tomcat version, we also wanna make sure that we apply all the same uh, hardenings that we did to the previous version. So in order to do this, we should have some repeatable process that can sort of like automate that. So just like a quick script that we can run that runs through our configuration and sets it all up again when we have to update or upgrade components. Um, Along with this, we should utilize a, minimize, a minimal platform with no unnecessary features. So um, if we're using like a Linux server, for instance, we should uninstall everything that we aren't using that isn't necessary. Um, anything that's default that comes with it that we don't need, we can just remove it. That way we can uh, lower the attack surface and make things a little bit cleaner, right? Um, in addition to this, if we're shipping the product to a client, we should advise the client on the proper security procedures and patches. Um, if they need to apply anything after a patch is applied or if they need to adjust anything on their system, they should know how those sort of things happen. And if we ever get any vulnerabilities reported to us, we should create test cases for them so we can ensure that regressions don't occur. So every single time we get in a vulnerability report, we create a test case, we patch it, we run our test case to make sure it doesn't work anymore. Every future version and every future patch, we run that vulnerability scan up against our system to make sure we didn't have any sort of regressions that are gonna cause that vulnerability to come back. So these would be the set of ways that you can um, mitigate security misconfigurations. And this will give you a general idea of how you can notice these misconfigurations to be able to detect and patch any sort of problems that come out of them. XSS or cross-site scripting attacks are a very common way to attack a web application that utilizes JavaScript or similar languages. Um, and typically it occurs when we're taking data from the user and outputting it to the screen in some sort of way. Now that input can vary in a lot of different ways, um, sort of similar to things like SQL injections, the locations um, that you can get those sort of inputs from are very varied, right? They can from input boxes, they can come from cookies, they can come from database uh, information that is provided by the user. They can come from files that are uploaded from the user and like the names of the data contained inside of the files. So um, it's one of the vulnerabilities that are very common in web applications and very easily preventable just by not trusting user input and filtering out uh, vulnerable characters and uh, not executing essentially user input as code. And that's essentially the theme of what this is all about. When you have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities available inside of your application, they're available because we execute user input as code or we write it to the page in a way that it can be interpreted as code. So we never want to allow those sort of situations to happen. And we'll discuss a few different ways that we can prevent this, but first we'll take a look at a few different ways that we can find these vulnerabilities and what they actually do. So we're gonna start off with uh, what is called a reflected XSS attack. The idea of a reflected attack is that it's not stored somewhere in the web page. What you have to do is you have to convince someone to input the vulnerable input, or you have to perhaps provide them with a URL that will do the input for you, or you have to um, you know, send the packets in some other way. So you aren't able to actually just like store it somewhere and anyone who visits gets attacked. Um, this one is one that has to do with um, people actually uh, inputting the input themselves. So let's go ahead and access the lab and let's take a look at um, the information here. Give a minute to log in. So essentially what's happening in this blog is when we search for something, say test, you'll see it says results for test, right? If we go ahead and inspect the element here, we can see that it writes whatever we wrote into this header here. So we are able to essentially write whatever we want into this header, which means that we can actually write JavaScript code. So for example, if I pipe in something like this, so script alert one script, what this does is the script takes tell the browser that we're gonna have some JavaScript. We put the JavaScript code here, which is an alert window that will pop up the number one, and then we end the script tag. When we search for this, you'll see our alert pops up on the screen. This is a perfect example of a cross-site scripting attack. When we input JavaScript code, rather than it displaying the information to the screen, it actually executes it as code. So we press okay here, and I'm just gonna show you what this actually looks like in the code so you can get a bit of an understanding. So you can see here zero results for, and then it has our script, right? So you can see that it executes our script inside of the header, and it gets interpreted actually as JavaScript rather than get interpreted as text. So the question would be, how can we prevent something like this from happening? 
the first way to prevent something like this from happening is to not allow for specific types of inputs. So, you know, the, these angular brackets, for instance, we can try to avoid those inputs. We can remove uh, semicolons, for instance, we can remove closing tags. That sort of idea is something that we can do to be able to help like filter out some of that data. Um, there are also specific ways to filter out um, the actual inputs themselves to sort of like escape those characters. So whenever you see like a, an opening brace, for instance, you can add like the escape character for the opening brace and closing brace to those. A lot of the time these are done through actual frameworks in JavaScript or related languages that will allow it to actually filter out those values before they're actually inputted. So that'd be the example of how we can sort of prevent this sort of thing from happening. But this gives you some intuition behind how this sort of attack can happen on a basic level. When we take a look at the other types of attacks, you're going to see how we can do it in a bit of a more complex way, but a way that does a bit more damage. With this example here, we would have to convince somebody to search the blog for that specific input, or we would have to send them a URL that has like this in the search. If we were to do something like that and the person accesses it, it would execute our cross-site scripting code. And um, there's a lot of different things that could happen from there. One of the most common things is that we can steal the cookies from the browser. That means that we can typically um, authenticate as the user utilizing their cookie. So that's one of the most common things that typically happens. Um, CSRF attacks are very common with cross-site scripting. Um, and th there's a lot of other different attacks. Basically, anything that you could do through JavaScript, you can do with these cross-site scripting attacks. So um, when we have these sort of situations where you have to convince the user to go to a specific URL or input something specific, it's actually a bit harder. Um, one thing that I will point out here is that there was a very big set of these attacks that happened, um, it was maybe five or so years ago, um, and essentially what happened is inside of the console, um, attackers were convincing users to type in specific sets of code promising that they would do something. Um, maybe like uh, expose some secret portal that they could like change specific settings or you know any sort of lie that you can give them to convince them to do that. What that actually did typically was send the cookie to the attacker um, so they could authenticate as the user and essentially hack their account. So that console input is another great example of this reflected cross-site scripting. And you'll actually notice if you go on pages like Facebook or Discord, for instance, if you open up this console, you'll see a big message there that says, do not input code into here. If you're being told to input code into here, you're probably being scammed. So um, it was big enough that all of the major sort of companies started to put that information in. So you could see that um, you shouldn't input code in there. So that's another common example of a reflected cross-site scripting attack. We're going to take a look at a stored cross-site scripting attack as well. These ones are a lot more dangerous, and um, these sort of attacks have happened a fair amount of times. Um, one of the biggest ones that I remember is back when YouTube was sort of in its uh, infancy and starting up, um, people were able to put cross-site scripting into the comments section. So you would go to the comments of videos, and they could redirect you to random sites, or they'd be popping up GIFs and all sorts of weird stuff. Um, that happened quite a while ago, but it was something that was quite big. If you were on YouTube at the time, you probably remember seeing that. And that was a result of stored cross-site scripting. And a lot of other web pages have fallen victim to this. A lot of others are still falling victim to it. I've personally found a lot of these in the products that I've investigated through my career. Um, it's very common to find these cross-site scripting attacks. They're just very common oversights from developers. So let's take a look at how this differs from the previous one. When we access this lab, what we're going to do instead of going to like the search or anything like that is we're going to go into the posts. And inside of the posts, you see that we can leave a comment. Now, if we're going to investigate some of these comments, we can take a look at them and see what they typically look like. And you can see inside of the paragraph, we just print out whatever the user put inside of there. Whenever we see situations like this, we should be thinking to ourselves, okay, this is a perfect location to try to do a cross-site scripting attack. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Like before, we'll use the exact same setup. We'll do script alert one. So again, like this. And for the name and all of that, we don't really care what we put in here. It doesn't really matter. Um, and we'll go ahead and post our comment. You see when we do, when we go back to the blog, you'll see it pops up with our alert, right? The difference between this and the reflected cross-site scripting is that anybody who visits this page, no matter what, is gonna execute our code. So this is a publicly facing one. We don't have to convince the user to do anything special to hit this vulnerability. All they have to do is simply visit the vulnerable web page and they'll get hit by it. This is again, extremely dangerous because there's no need to convince the user to take some sort of action. No user interaction requires, escalates the severity of this greatly because 
anybody who visits this site and has the misfortune of coming to a page that we compromised is going to get attacked by us. So we can execute our payload against almost anybody who accesses this site, unless they have like JavaScript disabled or something like that. So this is another sort of example. And again, the idea of it is very similar, very straightforward. The very last one that we'll take a look at is um, a DOM-based XSS. And the idea of this is that um, when we are working with JavaScript, sometimes we concatenate the user's input into a very specific location. And when this happens, we might need to actually escape out of that and then execute our code rather than executing it immediately. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like if we give an input and it lands in the middle of an array, for instance, we might need to like close off the quotation and then close off the array and then run our script. Or we may need to do something slightly different. Um, there are a few different tricks that we can use, such as onload, for instance. What we can do is we can put in HTML elements and say onload do this, or even on error. On error is typically the one that you'll see. Um, we could do an image and try to load something and say on error execute this JavaScript, and that will always allow us to execute the code rather than having to um, to jump through hoops to uh, close off the bounds or anything like that. So with this example here. It's relatively similar to the um, the first one that we took a look at. Again, we have our search here. And when we search, our content does get written um, to this page here, right here. However, it's not really something that we're able to attack. But there's more locations where we could potentially attack, and it would be right here. You see that this tracker.gif um, has the search terms inside of it. So we can actually attack this specific section here. And what we can do is we can sort of close off the image tag, and then we can put in another tag that will be able to execute our, um, our code for us. So the question is, how can we do something like that? Well, if we want to close the tag, we can put a double quote and then a closing tag here. So see, that would do search terms equals a closing quote, and then it would close off the image tag. And then what we can do is we can open up another tag, and then we can create another tag that's sort of like of our definition. So um, what you do here really doesn't matter. You could do like image tags. You could do any sort of tag here that will have um, sort of these features available in it. So as an example, we could do an SVG. An SVG is just like an image tag, right? And we could say on load equals alert one. So again, what this does is it closes off this image tag and then it defines a new tag that just um, is an SVG. It has an on load property that executes the JavaScript that we put in here. So essentially it closes off the first tag, it loads our new image. And as long as the image loads, it will alert us with that JavaScript alert. So we can go ahead and do this search. And as you can see, it executes our code. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like to, um, to understand a bit more. So you can see here, here's essentially the piece that we have. So you see, we close off this tag here and then we have our SVG on load here, which is the piece that we injected in. So you can see that we just sort of like close off the tag. We create a new tag that when it loads will alert and then we're done. Now there are again, other ways to do this on load is one on error is another one that's very common on hover is one that's quite common as well. Um, so you have to take into account that HTML elements can have JavaScript embedded in them too. So the key takeaways here are essentially the following. Whenever we print information to the screen that is provided by the user in any way, we have to make sure to sanitize that input in whatever way that we really can, whether it be escaping specific characters, whether it be avoiding certain characters altogether, whatever option you want to pick, whatever one's most appropriate for your application, you wanna make sure that you're applying it. Uh, the second key takeaway here is that JavaScript is not the only location that's vulnerable. If you have HTML elements that are being written, you can actually execute JavaScript through a lot of them. Specifically things like image tags, things like hrefs have on load, on error, on hover. You want to avoid being able to write those pieces, again, by either filtering out like on load or that sort of thing, or filtering out the brace brackets, or just like preventing specific characters, whitelisting certain things. Um, there's a lot of different methods that you can use to prevent this, but those are the key areas where you're going to see those attacks. So this gives you an idea of the three main XSS based attacks. And it gives you a bit of an idea of how they really look, what they look like in the source code, and what you should be looking out for in terms of preventing them. So remember that HTML and JavaScript are the two main areas. If you're writing HTML and JavaScript from the user, 
even like PHP echoes or anything like that. If you ever take something from the user and write it to the screen, you wanna make sure that you aren't vulnerable to this vulnerability by using some of the same methods that I showed you here by like writing a script that alerts one, for instance. If you do that through your inputs, you'll be able to easily tell if you're vulnerable to this sort of attack. So this would give you a good idea of how to locate these sort of attacks and prevent and patch them um, in your own web applications. Insecure deserialization is a relatively new vulnerability to the OWASP top 10 list. It's becoming sort of increasingly more popular, and although it sits at number eight on this list only, it's a fairly common vulnerability to see in a lot of different applications because of the process of serialization and deserialization being so central to a lot of applications that utilize object-oriented programming. So we're going to take a look at what deserialization really is and understand how it's used to exploit vulnerabilities and what we can do about it. So first off, what is serialization? So in web applications, we typically use objects to store data. When we store data in objects, we need some sort of way of transmitting them either into a database or across the wire to some sort of receiver. So maybe if we're communicating between like the client and the server, if the client creates like an object, they need to send it off to the server. Serialization is the way that that's done. And what we typically do is we convert the, um, the object into a byte stream that byte stream is sent off to the receiver, the receiver will receive it, and then they'll convert it back into an object. So this is really just a way of being able to store and transmit data um, when it's stored in terms of objects. So deserialization of, is of course the um, reverse process of serialization. So when the recipient receives the um, serialized object, they can turn that byte stream back into the object. And typically the process is like, um, so, say we have an object that has two properties, right? We, we turn it into a byte stream, we send the first property and the second property, uh, we might put the object at the very beginning, and then when the, when the person who receives it receives it, they see what kind of object it is, they see the properties in the byte stream, and they just build the object based on that information. So uh, the typical flow is gonna be that the sender will serialize an object, they'll send it off, the receiver will receive the serialized object, they'll deserialize the byte stream and back into an object, and in the end, they'll be able to transmit data in this way. So the vulnerability here is that an attacker can send their own data to be serialized, and then the deserialization process will be the portion that gets compromised. When the server pieces together the byte stream, um, we can potentially input data that is insecure. And if the server doesn't do proper um, validation on that data, it will potentially be able to cause some form of impact, um, whether it be escalation of privilege, remote code execution, information disclosure. There's a lot of different potential impacts of this type of vulnerability. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea, when you have escalation of privilege, it typically um, results of like tweaking a property of the object that's being sent off to escalate your privilege to say that you're an administrator or something like that. When this sort of thing happens, when the um, when the server receives the data, it will simply you know deserialize the object. It will turn it back into the object itself, and since it doesn't do any verification, um, it will just accept the object as is, assuming that everything you provided it is correct, and this will allow it to essentially escalate the privileges for you. Remote code execution is a little bit more tricky. If we have a situation where we're sending like a command in an object, for instance, you could potentially pull off like a command injection by changing that command. Um, and there's a few other different instances, like if we call specific functions or specific methods, we may be able to modify those pieces to be able to do remote code executions. And information disclosure, of course, comes from the idea of, um, you know, if you send off maybe an object that has an ID in it, you might be able to alter the ID to get different sets of information out of that object. So those are the typical sort of impacts of this type of vulnerability. So to give you an example, cookies are typically um, a way that object serialization and deserialization might be exploited. So suppose that we have a cookie for a web application that has a user, a role, and a password hash. If someone has a cookie like the one in the second bullet where it says Alice and she's a user and her password is 1234, we might be able to modify it to say change the user, change the role to administrator, and send it off to the server. When the server receives this and deserializes it, it won't be verified server side because we're just going to assume that the server is trusting the data, in which case it will see that an admin is trying to make an action and it will accept it because an administrator um, will have the ability to do that action. 
which will mean that they'll get admin access without actually having an admin account. So this is a very common way that object deserialization might be used to exploit um, to exploit a system to do like an escalation of privilege. So the main way to mitigate this sort of problem is to always verify user input. In the cookies example, when we send off that cookie and it gets deserialized by the server, the first thing the server should do is take that data and verify it against a database or something that it stores and has control over to see if that user is actually an administrator or not. Um, in this sort of way, we'll be able to ensure that they aren't able to escalate their privileges because we're verifying it in a location that isn't controlled by the user. A uh, similar sort of idea, if they provide you any sort of input, we should be filtering it out for any sort of commands or anything like that. We shouldn't ever use user input in a way that it might be able to get exploited. So we never trust user input and we always validate user input. Aside from this, web application firewalls could be a good additional mitigating factor for these sort of risks. Um, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem because even if you have a firewall, it doesn't mean that every single attack is gonna get caught. There could be a new type of attack that your firewall isn't prepared for and they might be able to get through. So really the best way to mitigate this problem is to keep your validation on server side and always verify user input. So this gives you an idea of what object deserialization is really about and how these vulnerabilities can exist on a system. So from this, you should be able to understand the general ways that you can exploit this type of vulnerability and understand how it can be mitigated and patched on the application server side. One vulnerability type on the OWASP top 10 is using components with uh, known vulnerabilities. So um, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of discuss the idea of web pages like CVE details, which can tell you a lot about products and what kind of vulnerabilities exist in them and give you some insight in towards how they can be fixed. And in that, we'll also discuss a bit about CVSS scores and discuss how vulnerabilities are scored to determine how severe they are, as those will all be very um, valid pieces of information towards um, using components with known vulnerabilities. So CVE details is a web page that can be used to find um, vulnerabilities by product types or open source software, for instance. Um, and this is just one that can be used. There's a lot of different ones that exist out there. Um, I know NIST is a really big one as well that can be used to um, look up CVE, CVE details as well. So um, as an example, we can type in a product that we want to look at. So for instance, we could say like Apache Tomcat. And what it will do is it will show us details about that product and what vulnerabilities exist. You can see over the years what types of vulnerabilities were actually disclosed inside of the product itself and the different types of vulnerabilities that exist. Um, you'll get a lot of different insights towards the vulnerabilities. And um, by going into these, you can determine, for instance, um, we can say in 2019, we can see all the vulnerabilities that happened in 2019 and which versions they apply to. So you can see that you can get a lot of good information about that sort of, um, that sort of detail on the uh, source component itself. So when we're deciding whether or not to use like one open source software over another or one framework over another, it's always a good idea to check out how many vulnerabilities have been reported and how many exist inside of that software. We don't want to use components that have known vulnerabilities as much as possible. It's not really going to be possible to avoid that when you're using open source software because um, there's always going to be new vulnerabilities coming out. So we just have to be able to keep consistently updating those, um, those components every single time that the vulnerabilities actually come out so that we can make sure that we're sort of ahead of the curve and ahead of the attackers. Now, these sort of vulnerabilities happen a lot. And because of that, it can be very hard to manage open source software to make sure that it's up to date. So you see these vulnerabilities a lot. A lot of companies have these vulnerabilities in their software and a lot of famous hacking incidents uh, are related to these sort of open source vulnerabilities. These things that are well known about by other people because the reason being is because um, if a vulnerability is really well known about, there's more of a likelihood that people will create proof of concepts, which makes it easier for people to be able to exploit the vulnerabilities themselves. Um, it also is possible that things like Metasploit will create modules for them to allow automated exploitation of those, um, of those components. So you want to have a good idea of what kind of things exist inside of your product. Um, and there are ways of like automating this. There are different like news sources that you can take a look at to be able to automate this sort of information. Um, but in general, you just want to be keeping an eye on these sort of things to get an understanding of them. So one other thing that we want to take a look at is like CVSS scores and understanding what those really mean to us. So for instance, if I go into 2018, you'll see that all of these have a score 
and it's a score that ranges from 1 to 10, where 10 is the most critical and 1 is the least critical. And you'll see each of these have like a, a varying range of uh, criticality, essentially, or high scores, right? So for instance, if I pick like one of these, say the highest one here, the 7.5, when we load this CVE, we're going to be able to see details about like um, what, sort of, what sort of components are affected by it, what versions are affected by it. You'll be able to see how we come to these sort of scores. So you'll see here, when we're taking a look at the impact of the vulnerability, that's how we're essentially scoring out these, these vulnerabilities themselves. So we're taking a look at the impact of confidentiality, so the ability to disclose information that is um, not supposed to be seen by other people. We're taking a look at integrity impact, which is modification of files on a system, and then availability impact, which is um, the ability for other people to access that component. And then we also take a look at the complexity of the attack. So it could be like low or high. Low means that there's very low skill required to exploit it. There's like automated processes that works every single time. Uh, higher things that maybe don't work every single time. You have to do a bit of trial and error. They have a higher complexity to them. Uh, we wanna take a look at whether authentication is required. So um, if we need to authenticate to a server, for instance, to be able to do an exploit, it has a higher bar of entry than just being able to do it without any sort of authentication. Um, we also take a look at how the how the um, exploit can be accessed through like what type of vector. So it's things like network, for instance, which can be done just like over the network from anyone who um, you know just happens to be able to see the server. Uh, there's like adjacent networks, which are people who are on um, a network that is in like sort of the same uh, sub network or in the same sort of uh, general area. And then there's like local attacks where you have to actually be on the system, and then physical attacks where you need physical access to the device itself. So those will each have different levels of uh, severity to them. And there are different calculators that you can use to calculate these CVSS scores. The CVSS scores are very helpful because they allow you to be able to express risk in a way that is known by everybody. When we report vulnerabilities to people, we typically want to use the CVSS scores so that they can get a better understanding of um, how critical this vulnerability is without us needing to sort of um, you know, express it in words. We can express it in this score instead, and it makes a bit more sense. So you can see here all the versions of Apache Tomcat that are affected by this specific vulnerability. And then um, from here, you'll also have your, your description of the vulnerability itself, which is here. It will show the version ranges that are affected, which will tell you in turn, if you're off one of those versions, you aren't gonna be affected. So it tells you essentially what you need to update to to be able to fix this vulnerability. Um, and then as well, there, there's a lot of different information that we can see here. Um, a lot of these references are going to be different um, different people that are talking about this. So for instance, um, you'll see that Red Hat has an entry on this. Uh, Red Hat is the Linux distribution, so they come packaged with Tomcat, so they'll have their own release on this sort of vulnerability, right? So everyone will have all these different releases on these vulnerabilities. So this is a really good place to come to learn about vulnerabilities, understand the vulnerable components that might exist on a system, and understand what needs to be done to fix them. So yeah, in general, using components with known vulnerabilities can be relatively easily mitigated by working with web page like CVE details to get an understanding of what components are vulnerable, what vulnerabilities exist, and then making an assessment based on the criticality of those vulnerabilities, whether or not you need to patch to the newest version. You also get details about like what situations the um, application is vulnerable on. Some descriptions are better than others, um, but this will give you a general idea of whether or not you're actually affected. So sometimes it might not you know, only work with Apache Tomcat. For instance, this one says the default settings of the cores filter. Um, if you aren't using the default settings, it means that you might not be vulnerable to this. So that's the general sort of idea. So you need to do a little bit of assessment and a little bit of work and in general, really the best way to avoid these types of vulnerabilities is to just keep your open source software as up to date as possible. So um, although this can cause conflicts with functionality, in the end, it's very worthwhile because it will help you avoid security risk. So this gives you a bit of an idea of what vulnerable components might exist and how you can sort of look up details about a specific component to see if vulnerabilities exist for it. And from this, you'll be able to see information about vulnerabilities for your products and be able to update them so that um, you won't be exploited with these known vulnerabilities.